Hey Tommy, guess what I'm holding in my grubby little hands here? You can see it on video, you can't hear it on the podcast, but what is it? Well, it's the key to the Jeep Wrangler 392. Hell yeah! This is the uh, thing that uh, we've been waiting for for 40 years now. Did you know that? 40 years. That was the last time that, well, it wasn't even a Wrangler back then, had a V8 in it. Yeah, and now Jeep has, from the factory, decided to cram a 6.4 liter into the Wrangler, and we just got back from Moab, Utah at the <laughs> Moab, Utah at the Easter Jeep Safari, and we got to drive it, we got to take it off road, and in this podcast, we're going to talk all about it. Yeah, but we're going to leave the uh, well, we're going to leave the big 392 to the end uh, because well, we want you to listen to the whole thing, of course. So first, let's talk about the Easter Jeep Safari, and that was exciting in itself because well, it didn't happen last year because of COVID. Uh, so it was such a pleasure to be out in Moab again uh, and to be out there with a bunch of, you know, Jeep guys and gals and seeing uh, the excitement around, uh, you know, the off-road community. And there was some controversy, so let's get right to that. We, when we went on the ride of the, uh, the ride drive of the 392, uh, guess who crashed the party, Tommy? Do you think we should explain what the Easter Jeep Safari is? Yeah, let's explain that. Good idea. It's basically Sturgis for Jeeps. So um, there are thousands of Wranglers and Grand Cherokees and just any Jeep uh, you can think of that show up to a little town in Utah. And then over the course of the week, people meet up and there's a vendor show with the off-road accessory companies and there's trail drives and the Jeep is there with all these cool concepts. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really fun kind of community thing where um, just tons of uh, Jeepers come together to take their vehicles off-road in some of the best terrain in the world. It started back in 1967 as uh kind of a way to get Moab on the map for tourism. Uh, so it's been around a long time and it's, you know, it's always been Jeep centered. Uh, and yet this year, um, Ford crashed the party, Tommy. Well, they kind of crashed the party. So there was No, they, they crashed the party. It's the Easter Jeep Safari. Jeep being the most important part of that, right? Not the, not the, uh, let's call it the Labor Day uh, Bronco uh, bash. What they did is there's a, a little kind of vendor expo called, um, and it was, a, it was at this place called Dixie's. Yeah, Dixie they, 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 they canceled the official one, but it happened anyway, kind of right. unofficially. Yeah, and um, in this in this expo, Ford had a booth, um, and they were giving rides in the um, full Bronco, and they were doing drives in the Bronco Sport. Yeah, they had, I think, what, five of each or something like that. We walked by it. You seem to be very unsettled by the Broncos. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, like I said, Easter Jeep Safari, the part of me is like, you know, I get it. I mean, it, it, look, there was a lot of excitement even at the Easter Jeep Safari around the Bronco. People are curious about it. It's a, it's a probably a smart uh, tactical move to have, you know, a direct competitor because let's talk about that too, right? There is no doubt that the Bronco is a direct competitor to the Wrangler, right? Basically what Ford did was they benchmarked the Wrangler and they said, okay, it's got this approach angle and the Bronco will be a little bit better. It's got this departure angle and the Bronco will be a little bit better. It's rolling on 33s, we're gonna go 35s, right? Uh, and so they basically went directly after uh, Jeep, uh, which, you know, I get that, that's great. I think that's good for all of us because competition makes prices go down, it gives us choice. But, you know, actually bringing it to the Easter Jeep Safari, that's a little bold. So the thing about the Easter Jeep Safari is it was founded in 67, like you mentioned, by the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Um, and now it's run by the Red Rock Four Wheelers, which is this um, club, basically. It's, and, a, it's a fundraiser for them. Yeah, and they put together these trail drives, right? Right. But it's, it's much bigger than just the actual Red Rock Four Wheel. So I think only a small percentage of people actually register and go on like the trail drives. Most people just show up because they want to uh, have fun with their buddies out on the trail. And yeah, there's, they, no, there's nothing that says you have to have No, a I mean... I mean I, we yeah. saw Defenders, we saw, you know, all kinds of other vehicles. But let's face it, 98% of the vehicles there are Jeeps. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And um, I mean, hotels get super expensive and restaurants are just, you know, overflowing. And it's, it's like you, you drive down the road and every car is a Jeep. I mean, it's something like out of a movie. Um, if, am I upset that Ford brought the Bronco? I mean, I understand why they did it. I think they're, they're trying to take away some of that core audience with, with the Jeep No, folks. I mean, they're trying to steal market share from Jeep. I get that. Yeah. yeah. For sure. They're trying to sell Broncos to people who would normally buy a Jeep. And I will say, in the 10 years we've been doing, I mean, like Toyota's never had an expo there. 
Right. Yeah, Toyota has the FJ Summit, which is its own thing that takes place out of basically... Uh, URA, or U Telluride. URA, yeah, it's URA. Uh, so they do their own thing, right? So it would be like Jeep showing up at the FJ Summit. Although that's very different because it's much smaller. Right, of It's course. limited to like 400 as, folks yeah. or something. And then Toyota's not nearly as involved as, as Jeep is in the Easter Jeep Safari. I mean, uh, Jeep, what they do is, uh, first of all, downtown they've got a big booth where they showcase all their Mopar stuff and, and um, some of the new models. But they specifically build concept vehicles uh, to gauge interest from the community and to give them tips and hints on what they should be doing. So every year they, they spend, I mean, I don't know how much they spend, but it's gotta be millions developing uh, these vehicles that are um, one-offs that, that kind of preview the future of the brand or, or just showcase, uh, let them flex their muscles and show what they can do. So sometimes they're like um, truck conversions. Like one year they took a Renegade and they built it into a little pickup truck. Another year, um, you know, they, they built like Gladiators before the Gladiator was a thing. So it, like, kind of that, that kind of deal. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, and we should go over that, uh, but before we do, let me, let me just finish up this little, you know, party crasher uh, It's not crashing the party. Qu question that I have, it is crashing, it's definitely crashing the party, it's definitely crashing the party, uh, but uh, the question I have is, what do you guys think? I'd like to get your take on it. Are you cool with it? Do you think it was uh, something that's smart or something that's a little um, bold, bold, let's call it that? Uh, I'm curious, you know, I think, I, I, I can tell you that, you know, when um, we were out on the trail drive doing the 392 uh, and, uh, you know, some of the executives uh, saw the Broncos there, they were not happy about it because they had paid for like the permits to use it, right? Yeah. And the Broncos were basically using the same area that Jeep had paid for the permits. So, so I think there was definitely consternation on the part of the executives that were there. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think. So let's start out with kind of a bucket list moment that you had because uh, you did get to drive, uh, and thank you to, to Jeep for this, uh, the new Kaiser. You want to talk about that? Uh, yes, I did. So I did post uh, the Bronco thing on TikTok to, to see what people thought of it. Yeah. Um, the number one comment is, well, it's not their event, kind of disrespectful. Uh, number two comment is, nice of them to bring something to show how superior the 392 Jeep really is. Um, should have flipped them when, off. When two camps go to war. That's uh, an old Frankie goes to Hollywood song. Ford the legend. There you go. Yeah. Um, Ford will be really disappointed. So it's kind of all over the board on what, what people think of it. Um, but so, yeah, so on Sunday, we went on a trail drive with the Jeep folks. And this was not really like a sanctioned event for journalists. It was no, just... No, it was super cool. They actually let us drive the, uh, the you know, Jeep was because that you guys listen to us and watch, so we're very grateful for that, super grateful. Uh, we actually got to choose one of the, not the new uh, concepts, but some of the older ones to drive up uh, a very difficult trail. I think it was very difficult. Well, maybe it wasn't difficult, it was scary. Uh, Moab Rim. The cool thing about uh, Jeep and these concepts is typically when a manufacturer does concepts, they bring it to an auto show and they park it in one spot and then they lock the door so you can't, you can't a, touch it, you can't a, crawl They in. put a rope around it. Yep, they, they don't want you to interact with it in any way because it's one off the prototype. Uh, Jeep builds a concept, they let folks drive it, and then 10 years down the road, they just thrash them off road as, as hard as they can. So I drove this vehicle called the New Kaiser. Which they built about 10 years ago. It was 2010, I think, was the year it debuted. And what it is, it was a Wrangler JK, so a, a four door Wrangler, but it was one called the J8. So it's a Gibraltar built military version of the JK. They uh, ripped the front end off of it, did a full custom military conversion to something called the Kaiser M715, which is this uh, slant nose truck. Uh, they chopped and channel, well, they chopped the roof line. They had a full custom a soft top built, which had to, the top itself probably was tens of thousands of dollars because to these are, these implement are, it. Look, easily these are you know hundreds of thousands, if not million dollars. I mean, they're, they're not one offs. They're not thrown together like a little third party aftermarket company may do. I no, mean, this they is look, Jeep. They they put a lot of funding and backing behind these. So, so kind of the heart of Jeep design is a guy by the name of Mark Allen, uh, and he's been doing it a long time, and uh, he works with uh, you know his boss. Uh, and basically gets a budget to create these factory one-offs. And this is what this was. Uh, uh, and it's a, it's a little pickup truck. What was it rolling on, 38s? 38s, yeah. So a little pickup truck. It's got a very interesting engine. So it has a 2.8 liter diesel. 
Um, well, the way that the, the Wrangler JK worked is here in the US we only got the, the gas V6s. But abroad, like in Europe, you could buy a 2.8 turbo diesel. It was made by VM and it was something to behold. A really interesting thing to drive. Now it did drive quite a bit like a JK and the interior was straight out of like a 2010 JK. So we had all the plastics and you know the steering wheel and all of it was exactly like you'd find in a 10 year old Wrangler. But the exterior design was just nuts with this custom made um, AEV bed on the back. It had uh, these beautiful bumpers on it. It was it's, it was wild. It's like if if you know the American military wanted a Jeep to use for you know their needs, the army. That this is what you would get, right? Right. And it was super cool, and it was a bucket list moment. So we have to thank Jeep for actually they let us pick which of the concepts we wanted to drive, and you chose a new Kaiser. Uh, and what was it driving it? What was it like driving it? Well, the trail we were on, as you mentioned, was Moab Rim. Which is, uh, uh, the first part of it is, um, is, a, is a pretty scary kind of ledge road. <laughs> and what I mean by a ledge road, right, is it's along a ledge and you're kind of going, it's not far from downtown and you're kind of going along the outside of the mountain uh, and there is this fun little obstacle right away called the uh, Devil's Crack. Yep, and if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to check out TLB Classics, I have a full video. But it's, it's, it's a three foot vertical ledge that is right on the side of the cliff yep. overlooking the Colorado River. And it was it was a real challenge. I mean, even with the air lockers engaged, it, it took me a few tries and a good 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 number of spotters to get this uh, this vehicle up and, there. And what makes it terrifying is if you move, let's say, four feet too far to your left, you will fall off a 500 foot cliff onto a road and then roll into the river. <laughs> I don't think. I think the you road, will, that's what the <laughs> fall onto the road would kill you before you ended up in the river. Rolling into the river, but yeah, it's it's butt clenchy and it's. Um, it, you know, it's, it's scary. And then you get to the uh, Z turn, which by the time you get there, it's actually fun because you're no longer on the, on the ledge, right? You're um, finally kind of more, more inland, yeah. More inland, and then it's just a very difficult obstacle. And then basically you go to the top, uh, and you can keep going, but once you get to the top, you have an amazing overview of uh, Moab. So the funny thing about Easter Jeep is there's so many vehicles out there that you, you get like these major traffic congestions on yes, these trails. It's, it's traffic jams. It's like LA, yeah, but in Jurassic Park. And um, so the, the trail itself is only like 1.5 miles, maybe 1.4 miles. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. But it took us, I think, eight hours to do it because first of all, <laughs> there were it. nine Jeeps in our group and then about another 3,000 on the 1.6 mile stretch. So it's a very like, you gotta have a lot of patience and just kind of sit back and enjoy it. But it was great, it was amazing. And definitely a once of a lifetime experience to be driving like this priceless one of a kind concept car on uh, terrain that, you know, it was potentially lethal for these vehicles. But yeah, I mean, we were out there with the VP and he was like, ah, if it gets scratched, it gets scratched. They're, they're super chill about it. They're, they're, they're super excited just to be out there. It's fun. You know, I don't think there's any other manufacturer, and we, we, you know, we certainly have been doing this long enough now, that would actually let you not only drive, they might let you drive the prototype. I think actually our friend Sofian got a chance to drive the ID4. Uh, while it was still camoed, but forget that, right? That, that that's just driving it. This is actually driving a prototype or a concept vehicle up what is one of the more hard and difficult and dangerous trails. Uh, you know, you you, you got to you got to have much respect for Jeep. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, the reason the Jeep sells about twenty thousand Wranglers, give or take a month, uh, is because of this enormous community of people um, who, you know, have had a strong input into what the vehicle is, right? I think one of the things that Jeep prides itself on, and, and sometimes, you know, this is, or more times than not, this is marketing, but with Jeep, it's true. They do listen to their customers, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was out there with one of their executives uh, sitting, sitting in the hotel, and a guy came up, and he had just bought a Jeep, and I introduced the executive. I don't want to, like, name names. It's not important. Um, and you would think, you know, that somebody who's running a company like Jeep would be, uh, pretty standoffish, but he was immediately, how do you like your vehicle? And then, then like to my horror, the guy said, oh, uh, my axle failed. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh my God, what did I do? I introduced this guy to, you know, to a, to a, to a customer who is not happy, who had just had an axle failure. And, and of course, uh, the executive was like, so what happened? Did we take care of you, right? Yeah. Uh, and the guy said, yeah, yeah, you replaced under warranty. And I was like, oh, this was just gonna be ugly. <laughs> but that's what I mean. I mean, it's a company that, that listens to its customers and that's why the Wrangler is what the Wrangler is because 
uh, Jeep and the people who buy them have a very close relationship. Um, and Moab is kind of the pinnacle of that, right? That's where at the Easter Jeep Safari, uh, they get most of their first-hand customer input into what, what the next or the current Wrangler should be. It was definitely a sight to see though, because you had a bunch of, you know, just guys from some, there were some companies out there, like I think Icon was out there doing some. Oh, everybody's out there, everybody in the off-road world. No, but I mean on that trail, yeah, yeah. on that trail at that oh, yeah, one yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, but then you had like these nine <laughs> concept vehicles from Jeep. Uh, that were being wheeled hard. I think someone like blew a bead on a tire at one point. I think that was Mark. Um, I think Mark blew on Stitch. I think. The, oh really? Yeah, I think he actually blew a tire. Bead, but, but they fixed it. But they had these cool like lightweight ones too. Uh, one trend that Jeep has been really pushing in these concepts, and I think we're going to see more of it in the production vehicles, is these super lightweight Jeeps. So they're like um, two door Wranglers with everything removed, the doors, the roofs, and then they even cut out. Uh, bits of the body, so that they, they, they trim down the actual sheet metal on the body just so it's as slimline and, and kind of tidy as possible when you're out on the trail. Yeah, these concepts kind of foreshadow what Jeep is working on, you know, in the next five to ten years. Uh, and so uh, Mark has really been pushing, uh, making things lighter. Uh, and it's the exact opposite of what's actually happening in the community, right? When you think about it, the first thing somebody does is they buy a Jeep and they want to make it their own. Uh, and that usually means taking off the bumpers, putting on bigger wheels and tires, uh, and it's adding weight, it's not taking weight off. And you would think that in the off-road world, you know, certainly in, in the racing world, being lightweight, and I'm talking about road racing, is hugely important, right? Formula One is probably the pinnacle of that. But it's the same thing off-road, right? The lighter a vehicle is, the better it does going over obstacles, the better it does bashing across the desert, you name it, lightness is about it. And, and I think Mark has been fighting that uh, trend to make it heavier and bigger and higher and taller, raise the center of gravity for a long time. So maybe some of that's coming. But let's talk about, uh, before we, once again, we know, we're gonna get to the 3 don't worry. We, we, Tommy just drove it for like, I think, what, 400 miles from Moab, so we got an MPG number we can tell you, which was actually surprising. We can tell you how it off-roads, all that. But before we do that, let's talk about the, the concepts that we drove. There are a bunch of them, but I think there are, are two that are worth speaking about. Uh, first, the one that we're gonna go drive, and we haven't driven yet, is the 4 by you, right? It's a new hybrid. Uh, yep. Wrangler. Uh, we're going to go drive that uh, in about two weeks. That uh, wasn't a concept though. No, that wasn't a concept. That was sitting there as a stationary vehicle, so we did do a little bit of a walk around on it if you're interested in that. It has, I think, one, I want to say a 17 kilowatt hour battery, plug-in hybrid. Um, 21 uh, miles of range. 21 miles of range. 470 pound-feet of torque, which is pretty good. Yes, yeah, so they had that there, but uh, the big the big thing they had this year was magneto yeah magneto so the four by is a production one it's a um p have uh, but magneto is a battery electric vehicle so they took a two-door wrangler and then they partnered with wabasto which is a massive company it's a big company you've never heard of yeah, <laughs> so they, basically wabasto builds every soft top for every vehicle out there i think but it's they a also, german, german company yeah they also do active aero right they do a lot of engineering behind the scenes and, for these major manufacturers that you probably haven't heard of and the cool thing is actually two years ago when we were at sema wabasto had built uh, an all-electric mustang and what they did was they actually kept uh the uh um, stick shift, right? They kept the manual transmission in the thing, uh, and this is exactly the same thing that they did for Magneto or that Mark had him do. And Mark had him build a, a two door, interestingly, which you would think would be kind of not the you know, best platform for a vehicle that's going to have to have a lot of batteries. So, what they told us, which is pretty funny, is they, they needed a base Jeep to start with, yep. right? So, they come up with their sketches and their designs, and then they have to put it in production. So, they start with a base Jeep. Um, and they were saying that on the typically they use like vehicles that have lying around like ex development mules or maybe old press vehicles. But they said they couldn't for the life of them find a two door Wrangler on the property with a manual transmission. They couldn't do so it. So they had to go to a dealership and pay full sticker. Full sticker. <laughs> they buy, were they were buy. really grumpy about this. They went to like a local dealer. They tracked one down. Uh, it was the wrong color. It was orange. <laughs> and they the Jeep corporate paid full price for this. Two -door they bought back a two-door Wrangler that had been sitting on the... Uh, you think they could just like pull one off of the assembly well, well, line, look, the but they don't work like, like that. Like 75% of all Wranglers are the Unlimited or the four-door, right? Uh, and then, you know, you, to make that even more rare, uh, the, the manual is, the take rate on that is, even in a Jeep, is very low. You think they could just build themselves one, don't you? You think, yeah, you think they could just build, it's supposed to buy it, but they didn't. Uh, so they started with this two-door manual uh, Wrangler. And it was the wrong color, it was orange, yep. and they wanted it to be white, so like, of course they had to <laughs> redo the, the old body work. And, and it was funny that Mark Allen said, you know, they called it Magneto, right? And when I heard Magneto, of course, immediately I thought of X-Men. Yep. 
and Mark was like, "Hey, sorry, I didn't. I'm not <laughs> into Marvel. <laughs> Marvel." So he had no clue that he named this thing after you know one of the premier one of the premier guys in X Men. <laughs> so what they did then is or villains actually they removed the 3.6 liter V6 yeah. out of the um, the engine bay yeah. and they replaced it with an electric motor and they detuned the electric motor to have the same power output as the V6. Yeah, and they could have done anything, right? They could have, but they wanted it to be like the V6. Well, I think there's more to that story. Yeah, I mean, they could have tuned it. I, no, yeah. but I mean, I was talking to the engineer behind it, yeah. and he said it's it was rated at that number because that's what the transmission oh. is rated to handle. Sure, but the, but if they wanted to, they could have upped the amount of torque and horsepower. I'm sure they could have, but you, you, you can officially the official thing that the Jeep was saying is because they didn't want it to be an experiment in power, they wanted it to be a showcase of what right, they I potentially agree. could do. But the engineer was saying it's it's based on the power rating as and, well as the transmission. We, we drove it. We've got a full video. It was cool to drive. The craziest thing about it is because there's no, um, uh, you know, engine running on. You know, so when when it's standing still, standing still, you put it in first gear and you let off your, uh, you let off, you, you don't have to like actually have the thing creep. It just sits there. The way it works is uh, engine is bolted directly to the transmission yep. um, with a beefed up clutch. And you still need the clutch to change gears. So, yep. so the clutch is still needed to go between gears. But here's the fundamental of how you drive this Magneto Wrangler. So around town, you select a gear. Let's say third gear. Uh, you push in the clutch, you stick it in third gear, you take your foot off the clutch, you're still stationary, and you drive it like an automatic. So third gear will take you um, from yeah, zero. Of the amount of torque. Yeah, it, I mean there's zero all the way up to like I don't know low low highway speeds, right? Uh, and you just drive along in, in third gear. And there's a tachometer. Uh, Jason was telling me that in this application, currently the uh, electric motor has a red line of 4,500 RPM. So imagine what 4,500 RPM is like in a in a Wrangler in third gear. And then if you go on a highway, you push in the clutch, shift it into fourth just like you would, and you just drive it in fourth, for example. Uh, the cool part is, though, it still has the transmission bolted directly to the transfer case. So when you're off-road, you can stick it in a low range, select first or second gear, and then you have ultimate control um, and potentially even a little bit better efficiency because think about like riding a bike, right? If Even though electric motors have a ton of torque, um, you know, you, you still ideally would be in a lower gear when you're going slowly so, up a big mountain. So let me ask answer a couple of the questions that you're thinking about right now. First of all, what's it like to drive? Um, it's cool. It really is cool. Uh, you know, it was a bit of a science project because uh, they didn't uh, water cool or climate control the batteries, so they're all air cooled basically. Um, so I don't know if that would be something that would actually make it into production, but I think they said they had, what, 70 kilowatt hours of battery in the thing? Yeah, 56 kilowatt hours are usable. It's an 800 volt system. Yeah, which is also like the uh, Hummer H2, uh, also like the Taycan. Not the H2. Um, the the um, Hummer EV. EV, not the H2. H2 and a 6 liter V8. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, behind the transfer case, it's just a normal Wrangler. So it's got solid axles from the back. It's got uh, locking differentials. And then the batteries were, the, were really the hard part because you need a lot of batteries. Yeah. So they put batteries under the engine bay. They put batteries where the fuel tank lived. Where the, where, where, where the exhaust is. Yeah, where the muffler is. is yeah. um, but the cool thing is because it's a Jeep, they heavily reinforce the batteries. Right. So it's got like 3 sixteenths or something he was saying, skid plates. Um, they wanted it to have batteries. all the capability. It's a Rubicon. They wanted to have all the capability of a Rubicon. It didn't have some capabilities of an electric vehicle, so it didn't have fast charging. So it only had level 2. 11 kilowatts, yep. Yeah. Um, it did have regenerative braking, yeah. which was cool. Very cool. Um, and it range-wise... Uh, they it, said between 100 and 150, but that was a guess. It wasn't about, you know, the range of the thing. It was more of a prototype to see if an electric Wrangler is actually feasible. Now, that does sound terrible, right? I think to a lot of people listening. Yeah, sure, but it's not a production miles. vehicle. But you also have to keep in mind, too, it's uh, it was rolling on 35-inch tall tires, yeah. which is a very big tire. And if there's a video over a TFL car, if you want to see us driving it. Yeah, 35 by 12 and a half, so that's a really, really big tire. Um, and it's also <laughs> very, very heavy. 5,750 pounds heavy, so ri ridiculously weighty, um, especially for a two-door Wrangler, which are pretty light. So, so I was filming you and Nathan while you were driving about, Tommy, uh, and uh, you know the sense I got, which was really cool, was I could actually hear you talking. Right? There's like two bookends here. There's like the 392, which is this like ground-destroying, uh, crazy quick, uh, super accelerating, over-the-top Wrangler, right? Mm -hmm. Which 
you know, you're going to war against uh, the natural environment when you take that out on the trail. Or there was Magneto, which is the exact opposite, right? It's still heavy, but nevertheless, it's kind of just, you know, it was nice to be able to hear uh, all of nature and not just hear the roar of a V8. So it really, you've got two bookends, and I love that. I mean, right now, I think Jeep is going to have, what, five? Let's talk about that, five power plants in the Wrangler. So you've got the Pentastar. V6. Yep. Then you've got the diesel. Three liter, yep. Yeah, three liter diesel. Turbo. Then you got the two liter turbo. Four cylinder. Right. Then you've got the 392. Yeah, the V8. And now you're going to have the four by. Which is a two liter turbo and a big battery. Yeah, so so we're living in really the um, high tide of choice for Wranglers. You've got five powertrain choices. And I would say if any of those appeal to you, buy them now because I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, FCA has recently turned into Stellantis because they were basically purchased by Peugeot, and, and my gut tells me, and I have no inside knowledge of this, so this is not a fact, but my gut tells me that, that five um, power cho cho choices in a Wrangler um, are going to be uh, not long-lived, right? Stellantis, and the CEO of Stellantis is known for cost-cutting, uh, being ruthlessly efficient, uh, and so to me, you know, if you want a diesel Wrangler, that's the one I would go out and buy. I think that's the one that, that, that probably will not last the longest. You would personally buy the diesel? I'm not saying I would buy it. I'm just saying oh, if you want one. Yeah, I think it's very going to be and, very short-lived. And, and I also think the 392 will be short-lived. Very short-lived as well. So let's talk about the 392. Yes, I think the thing it's... you've been waiting for. We've kept you waiting long enough. So um, first things first is it, it isn't officially, but it, I think we all know it's response to the Bronco. You know, well, they said they started developing it before the Bronco, but they, yeah, they started like three years ago. They said I think they started. A, they were saying what 2018. Yeah, three years. And ago. they knew that Bronco was coming. Yeah, I mean, they knew it. I th I think they knew for sure. Um, and uh, it's the one that everybody's been asking for. Yeah, right? yeah, and it only took them 20 years to do it. <laughs> 40. 40 years. <laughs> yeah, I think the last one to have it was the CJ5 five or seven in 1980 or 1981, and that was 125 horsepower out of a 304 V8. How much is this one? Let's start with the horsepower. Numbers. 470 horsepower. Yeah, 470 pound foot of torque. Yeah, 470, 470, 6.4 liter Hemi. Uh, and then uh, they had a cutaway. Uh, if you're at Moab, you can go check it out. It's at Walker Drugs. Uh, basically, they took a the top off of it, and then the engineer who was in charge of developing it uh, talked to us about it because I just thought it would be, hey, let's just stuff a big old V8 that we have, you know, into the Wrangler. But it's not that simple. The most interesting thing he said, I think, was that because the uh, fenders of the Wrangler live on the outside of the body. Uh, when you think about that, that makes the engine bay very small. It's kind of pointy and narrow. Yeah. And so stuffing a big old V8 under there was not easy because it was too wide and too tall. It was, I mean, it, it, it was jammed into yeah. this. Uh, there was not an inch of space anywhere. So uh, Stellantis now has two 6.4 liter V8s. There's the one that you find in the Ram 2500, yeah. which is like the work truck engine built for longevity and to kind of tow big loads. And then there's a the fun one, which you find in the Challenger, like the Scat Pack. This is the fun one. So it's it's the uh, the higher output of the two. And I mean, it was so jammed in there, they actually had to bang and dent away the uh, the front of the, the, the forward cross member just to get it to fit. Yeah, so what they did was they took the faceplate of the engine. This is where all the pulleys are. They took yeah, the that, accessory drive. Accessory drive. They took that off and redesigned it, moved the alternator up higher, which is always a good thing because you don't want it getting wet. I also don't think it would fit anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. would, this alternator wouldn't fit anywhere else but in the spot. And, and then because the engine was so much taller, they had to create this which looks badass, this hood scoop for it, but the hood scoop then causes this issue, right? It's a front-facing hood scoop, where if you're water fording, right? Yep. After 10 miles an hour, you create a bow wave, and then all of a sudden, all this water goes flooding into the hood scoop, which normally would mean that all this water goes flooding into the engine, which is not a good thing, but they created a special hy hydraulic Hy separator. Hydro guide, hydro, it's Hydromatic, I don't know. Water separator. Let's just go with the vernacular. So it's the same. It, it looks, the design wise is similar to the Gladiator Mojave. Yeah. But do you remember what they said about it, which was interesting? And I have to verify it with a magnet, but I think it's true. So the Mojave has an aluminum hood, and yeah. Jeeps typically have aluminum hoods. Um, this hood is freaking heavy. Well, I got the key right here. We'll go. Uh, we'll, we'll go, go stick a magnet on it. Uh, yeah. But um, on the, the, the concept, and I think it's the same on the production, they said they used an export hood off of a uh, a diesel gladiator Mojave. So like one that was destined for other markets and for some reason due to regulations in other markets it was a steel hood. 
But uh, how about, how, okay, go ahead. So that was the engine, um, and then should we should we talk about the exhaust? Yeah, so it's got true headers, right? So you've got dual exhaust coming out either side of the engine. Well, I. I don't know if they're headers in like the performance standpoint. I mean, what's cool about it is it's, it's not a, two into one. It, they, 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 they it's go, a dual exhaust right. all the way to the back. So the it, back. it doesn't have, it, it never comes into one unit. There's an X pipe kind of in the middle. Yeah. But it's duals into the rear muffler. Right. And then the muffler, it's got four exits. Yeah, it's got a quad exhaust. It's really badass. And it's got these little vacuum pods on the side of the muffler with these little actuators. Um, and these actuators uh, will turn on and off the cutouts. And you can basically make it straight through, a straight pipe exhaust. Yeah, it makes system. it loud or soft. And there's like this little raccoon switch. It looks like a raccoon. Well, you hit it, and then it makes it loud or quiet. So, And then you said when you were driving at home, when you accelerated onto the highway, it actually, when you're full throttle, it actually opens up those, I think they're probably like butterfly valves. Right? Yeah, you it don't allows even, that, that you, exhaust note to go out the back. You don't even need to be full throttle. I mean, as long as you're over like half throttle, um, you, you can hear it's, it's, you can hear the change in the note because I think the engine breathes. It needs so much just airflow it, out it, of it it's, that it's, it opens it up. It's wacky and cool because it sounds like a Scat Pack uh, Charger or Challenger. I'm not sure I will trust the longevity of those little baffles though. Vacuum systems and off-road vehicles are typically a uh, uh, not a great idea for long, long term well, longevity. It's also heavier, right? So they used a Rubicon setup, but uh, I think they uh, strengthened all the uh, points where the suspension is attached to mm -hmm. the frame. Yeah, it actually has different uh, mounting points on the frame. Sorry, different. Yeah, different mounting points on the frame for like the control arms. Yeah. So that they move the actual mounting points uh, down a couple of inches. Uh, they beefed up the front end of the frame. Um, and then they dented the front cross member to get the, the darn thing to fit in there. It's a heavy, I, I forgot to look up the curb weight. I it's, should do it's that. A, it's a heavy beast. Uh, I, also, I, I also think they changed the brakes around from a regular regular ride, so well, they took the brakes out of a... Gladiator Mojave brakes yeah, in the front. Uh, yeah. Um, Wrangler 4xE brakes in the back. Back, yep, to make it a little bit, you know, stop as well as it goes. Still uses Dana 44 axles, but the axle tubes have been beefed up. Yep. So it's got stronger axle tubes. Um, Do we what, know the 0 to 60? Yeah, 4.5 according to Jeep, 0 to 60, and then the quarter in 13 seconds. Which is the same as basically a TRX. It is pretty slow in the top speed though. Yeah, 99, 98 miles an hour, but that's due to the rating on the on the, on the tires. On the tires, and you can get either mud terrains or all terrain, just like you can in any Rubicon. Uh, so uh, those are the basic facts. Now, um, it is an expensive Jeep. Um, it's the most expensive Wrangler ever, I think. I want to say it starts at seventy-three thousand, Tommy. Uh, you know, and the one that we had had that uh, optional four and a half thousand dollar soft top. I didn't have a sticker on it, but you can get this thing well into the eighties, nineties, or maybe even a hundred thousand if you get all the bells and whistles. Exactly. So let me price it out. Actually, I'm on the yeah. Jeep configurator. So we have the integrated front camera. That's um, new. It used to be on the Gladiator. Now it's also on, and it's got a little squirter on that, so you can squirt it off. For the most part, there are no options. Very few options. They, they also bolstered the uh, seats, made them a little bit better. They're still, I think, it's that's it, one of its Achilles uh, points are the seats. I, I just find that those seats, uh, well, first of all, they're not power. So if, let's say you get a seventy-seven thousand dollar one, uh, not having power seats at seventy-seven thousand dollars. Uh, is kind of a big deal. Not having them at 40, I can see, but at 70, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, all right, I f figured it out. Yeah. Um, so most options are standard. Yeah. Uh, almost everything is standard on it because it's basically a loaded Rubicon, and you can only get it in the Rubicon form, too. Okay, so how, uh, maybe I was wrong, how expensive is it? 78185 Yeah, okay, so up to, you can get up to probably, it's going to be 80 with that, you know, I think they're up to $2,000 in destination fee now. Uh, yeah, and then if you... Um, Jeep. That's what there's a couple at. of things, so you can get trailer tow package. The roof is going to be four and a half. Two. Two and a half? Two, just two. Just two, so they lower the price. Well, what Jeep does is they, they change the price depending on which one you get. So $2,000 for the Sky One Touch. Right. Uh, $350 for the trailer tow group on ours. Which, it doesn't tow very much, three and a half thousand pounds. You have... Do you think like it would tow more, but it doesn't. Three different tire options, which is interesting. One different wheel option. No interior options in terms of op features. They all have the 8.4 inch you connect all that. So I misspoke. So you can get it up to 80000 plus. Yeah, which is nuts. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Absolutely. So, so one, of the, one of the biggest glaring omissions to me is why they put it on 33s and not 35s. I think in the past, 
Um, they've done that probably, and I'm guessing here, once again, we don't have this from um, Stellantis or Jeep, but you know, it was for fuel economy, right? You put on 35s, you're going to get worse fuel economy. What is fuel economy officially? Um, it's, ooh, I just, I just looked I it up. I say it's 13, 14, 17. That's right, yep. Um, so, so 13 city, 14 combined 17. So the issue, the, issue with the, the issue with the tires is that it's an inch taller. They had to lift it an inch so they could get the clearance with the engine and the axle. And they're still rolling in 33s, and they're just too small. Because Bronco now, Sasquatch, can be back to 35s. And I'm sure people put these on 35s. And I think in the past people would have done that immediately, but now that you have a competitor out there coming from the factory on 35s, you can't have your top dog Jeep rolling on 33s. Although if you're spending 78 grand on a Jeep, the first thing you're gonna do is spend another $1,200 on, on tires. I, or go buy a Bronco for 65. For, okay. Launch edition is 64. Well, you can't buy a launch edition anymore. <laughs> you just can't. They were like 3,500 of them. Um, people are not going to be cross shopping this with the Bronco. I really don't think so. Not the 392. The 392 is so expensive. It's so out of this world price wise. I think the pe there's two people are going to buy this Jeep. Folks that. So let's let's do this. I'll let you finish. Yeah. But let's do the things we love about it and the things we don't love about it. Well, let, let me finish my yeah, thing. So finish so with the people who are buying it. Go so ahead. two folks are going to buy it. All right. Hardcore off-roaders who have who have the money to spend on this. Right. So in the past, if you want 40-inch tall tires, uh, a lot of folks would go out and buy a Wrangler and then spend twenty-five thousand dollars swapping a Hemi into it. You're up to eighty, ninety thousand dollars like that. It happens really quickly. Uh, those folks they can now buy one out of the factory, fresh from the box. The other folks that are going to buy this, I think, and I could be wrong on this, but I really do think this might appeal to the G-wagon people. Uh, you know, folks who are not passionate about off-roading, but want the ultimate top dog SUV who, uh, with a big lumpy V8 in it. Um, think like the, the new Defender V8 folks. I think that this could appeal to folks on Beverly Hills who, uh, you know, want something that, says, that, that makes a statement about themselves, but also want the ultimate. All right, so let's talk about the things we love about it. First of all, we did get to drive it both uh, kind of in some classic Moab, Rocky, you know, ledgy, off-roady areas. And uh, what, what was the trail we did? Remember? Behind the rocks. Oh, we did behind the rocks, yeah. And then we did get to take it into the sand. So if you're looking for a Jeep uh, that is the ultimate Baja runner, this is it. They soften up the suspension in the rear by 20%, and it m does make a big difference. It actually rides, I think, probably the best riding Wrangler there is right now. Uh, uh, and uh, in the sand, with that exhaust note and with that much horsepower and torque, it's just a monster. It really is. It's almost like a Baja runner. It's really, really fast. And it's good in the rocks, too. It still has the lockers and the sway bar disconnect. It's still going to go everywhere. But, but you do feel that big, heavy V8. Yeah, it's not as good as like a two liter in the rocks, but right. it still is. Once again, that's where the weight comes in. More capable than 99%. So, so of I, I suppose if you're going to go bigger than, you know, a lot of people do go bigger than 35s. If you're going to go 37s or maybe even 40s, this thing will have the. Uh, um, the horsepower and torque to twist those and turn them. So here's here's the good thing, right? A couple of years ago, maybe five, six years ago, we actually drove a V8 Jeep that the dealership here had done. And a lot of people are putting V8s into their Wranglers, be those uh, Mopar products or be those you know Chevy products, right? People are swapping engines. Uh, and if you do that, or if you have a company do that, uh, it's going to cost you a lot more than $80,000, more like $100,000 or $120,000. Uh, and you're also going to have this issue where it's kind of done at the local shop. So, you know, no warranty to speak of, not a factory warranty at least. Uh, and certainly, you know, they're not going to upgrade the brakes for the most part and upgrade the chassis, upgrade all the things that Jeep did. So, so it is a bargain basement V8 swap if that's what you're looking for, right? Yeah. And with, with a warranty. So, so in that way, it, it, it is relatively affordable. The issue with the warranty though is the second you put 40s on this thing, your warranty is not going to be very applicable anymore. Did, it, did they beef up the axles, you know, or did they keep... Oh, they, they did beef up the axles a little bit, but Jeeps, I mean, if something breaks in the powertrain... They still? Yeah. Okay. If something breaks on the powertrain and you're rolling on 39-inch tall tires, well, I don't see your your dealer being like... Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying, if, if you want the one that, um, you know, is going to be factory warrantied, if you don't mess with it to that extent, then this is the one to get. So in that regard, it's a bargain, right? Um, so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a huge thing. Uh, uh, like the TRX, uh, you just drove it on the highway, it's effortless power. Yeah, and actually, the fuel economy is pretty good. What did you get on your MPG loop? I, so I drove it from Moab back to here in Colorado. We haven't published this video yet, so you're going to be the first ones to hear this. No, and I did it based on our pump method, and yeah. it averaged 18.8, which, which is better than the E17 highway EPA rating. And better than the TRX. 
which is you know, yeah, much much better than <laughs> T-Rex. More like twelve. Yeah. Uh, of course, seven hundred two horsepower. Uh, um, so you've got the ultimate highway cruiser because it's just you know it'll just lope at two thousand RPM at seventy miles an hour all day long. Yep. Uh, it also has by far the best exhaust note. Oh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, the exhaust note is killer. Yeah, it's killer. Once you put it in that little, I'm gonna call it raccoon mode. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't it's, look like it's two exhaust pipes. How do you get raccoon out no, of two exhaust pipes? Right, cool. Anyway, uh, it does. Uh, check out our video. You'll see the switch. And let me know if you agree with me. I'm gonna call it raccoon mode. If you go to raccoon mode, it's pretty badass and it's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, the other positive uh, that I think that you have is you're gonna have the top dog Wrangler, right? You're gonna you're gonna be the big boy on the block. Uh, and nobody else is going to, you know, uh, be able to compete with you. The guy in the three six is probably going to be like a uh, or gal. Uh, but there are some downsides to it. Uh, fuel economy isn't grand, but that's okay. I mean, you understand if you're getting a V8, you're probably not going to get great fuel economy. But what's your biggest downside? And I agree with you 100% on this. What do you think? Where is the miss? Well, so if you kind of look look and read through the lines, they marketed this as another option, engine option in a Wrangler. Right. They should have marketed it as an entirely new model, and maybe they are going to, but they didn't differentiate it enough from every other Wrangler. So I drove it back, you know, six, four, 300 miles or something. I drove it downtown here in Boulder, and that's kind of my, my gauge. Drive it by a big group of people, see what people think when you drive it by, and it's just too subtle. So I think part of the magic in like the first-gen Raptor was those crazy graphics on the side, and the super wide width, and visually, this Jeep looks too similar to every other Wrangler. They made the tow hooks bronze. gold, Roll bronze, gold. Yeah. They gave it a hood scoop, yeah. but it just it doesn't have that like. A, they, gave, they gave a quad exhaust and a 392 badge. But That's the, qu all. the quad exhausts are, are really hidden underneath for the departure angle. Yeah. The 392 badge is just on the hood. It's just it needs more. It needs some kind of flames on the side. I like Nathan's idea. He said it needs side pipes like on a G wagon. That would have been really cool. I mean, it just needs some pop. There needs to be something crazier about so, it. So here's my here's my. I think if I if I had been doing this right. What we've learned from the Raptor, and the Raptor has been hugely successful, are there are four things you need to make like the top dog truck, or in this case, the top dog Jeep, right? You need one, a different power plant, which this has, or a more powerful power plant, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. This, this has it. Yep. Then you need to change the styling around. And what I'm talking about there is, of course, the Raptor is wider, it's got those big, right, like fender flares that make it look much more aggressive. Um, that's number two. Uh, number three, you need um, different suspension. You need a different change the suspension. So, you know, if you've got 2.5 inch shocks, you need to go to three inch shocks. If you've got three inch shocks, you go to need, need to go with 3.5 inch with, you know, piggyback reservoirs, right? And finally, you need to, you need to up the size of the tire. Right, and then you need to give it a, I think the 392 is fine. I would have called it the Honcho. I mean, it, that is in Jeeps. Uh, pocket, right? They own that name, I suspect, right? Yeah. So call it something different. Call it the Wrangler. You know, like, the, like the Thunder Chicken Trail Cat. <laughs> something really cool. The, Hach, the Honcho Wrangler or the Wrangler Honcho. I don't know. Uh, uh, so they, they, they kind of got, you know, one of those four things. But I think if they really wanted to, you know, hit it out of the ballpark, they would have gone for all four. And that would have made it much more expensive. And I think people would have paid more because the G-Wagon starts at 126 Mm -hmm. Right, this starts at 70, what did you say? 70, 74. 74. I think if they had done all those four things, or if they, if they can still do it, they could easily make this a $100,000 Jeep and people will pay for it. And that's when you're competing with the G-Wagon and, and I think even like the Range Rover. Um, and, and you're playing in a different ballpark. The interior also needs to be... Differentiate. Differentiate. I mean, so you get a different steering wheel with paddle shifters. And yeah, you, get, you do get paddle shifters, too. You get seats with some more bolstering. But the infotainment's the same, the button layout's the same, the features are the same. Like, for $74,000, it should have standard power seats. It should have standard lumbar support on the passenger side. Uh, I mean, these are things that you'd expect out of any vehicle with $74,000, regardless of, of the name on it. So that is a big problem with, with it for me as well. Um, yeah, I just, it needs, I mean... So I'm many just, people, I'm just, I'm so just, but so many people when they buy these top dog vehicles like the T Rex and the Raptor, they they want they want it because it looks different. It looks just out of this world, and the 392 just doesn't. And we're gonna take it to Cars and Coffee tomorrow, and I can guarantee, almost guarantee, that no one will blink an eye at it. Maybe they put a big flag on it that says V8. Yeah, I hope maybe. <laughs> I hope somebody will look at it. I don't know. I think for a Jeep enthusiast, those guys and gals who are really into the culture, they will understand what this is. But I was in the culture yeah. in Utah, and yeah. there was one guy that stopped me and was like, wow, was that the 392? Yeah. But I drove past countless who just 
didn't blink an eye at this Jeep. I, you know, I don't know. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm guessing that Jeep knows more about how to market and sell. Oh, for sure, than I do. Than oh, we, yeah, than absolutely. We do. But if, like, if it was me, I'd probably do all four of those things, and you know, take the price up 200k, and then sure. when people Why start, not? when people start. You know, whining and complaining about the 100K, you can just say, hey, you've got a vehicle that now competes with a G Wagon or a Range Rover. I think that 78 or whatever ours is, is so out of the budget of most people that jumping up to a, at that point, jumping up to 100. They, they, they are going to hit some issues, right? So, so the problem is, of course, uh, there's a Defender 90, which is a two door um, or a four door, and uh, uh, Land Rover has announced a V8 version of it. So they are going to have a direct competitor with a Land Rover Defender V8. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I also think at some point, um, and I'm not guessing at this, but I, I bet you there will be a Bronco with a Coyote under the hood. But I think if they're not working out now, I don't know. I think they, Ford they is... started working out like a year ago. No, I disagree. They, they're doing it for the no, record No, because there's the Warthog, which is going to be their top dog Bronco. At, at some point, they're going to stick a Coyote in it. And from all accounts, the Warthog's going to have probably the 2.7 Twin Turbo V6. Yeah, of course. But when I say Coyote, I mean, maybe I'm being too inside baseball. It's a 5 liter uh, that's in the Mustang, right? Yeah, I, I, I doubt. I highly doubt with the way the Ford's been going. And I think so, that, so I think that the, the Raptor they're going to do is a really specialized small And they'll do a special thing. edition V8. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. Give it a year, there'll be a V8. I don't think so because I think that this 392 is going to be a but now one. It's not built. Yeah, I think this 392 is going to be a one or two year thing. I mean, I don't think that 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 Jeep can, what, can what get away anymore. What if it flies off the shelf? What if all the people who got stimulus money decide that the stimulus, the best stimulus, use of their money. stimulus? How much stimulus money are you getting? <laughs> the check is to put your down payment on a, Look, on a 392. From what I've read, the head guy at Peugeot is a ruthless penny, penny pincher, <laughs> and Peugeot is not going to understand well, that, but, but 6.4 that, Hemi's and Wranglers. But that's that's not a market thing. That's a Peugeot thing. Well, I, yeah, I, I just I don't see them keeping this around for more than a couple model years, especially with the new the change in administration and maybe increased I mean, gas prices. Obviously, it's going against the grain. It's you know selling into the wind because the one that everybody is expecting is the Magneto production version, right? Is the electric Wrangler. Well, we'll see what they do. Uh, I hope I hope, um, and of course the, the, the you know the one that we haven't talked about yet, which could be the G wagon killer, is you know what I'm talking about. The what? The Hellcat version. They're not going to do the Hellcat. I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> this 6.4 is already too dangerous as it is. You, you plant it and the whole thing already like tilts to the side 40 degrees as you accelerate. I think a Hellcat would be a liability for this they world. They did it. They did a concept. They did a trail cat oh, a few they years did ago. The, they That's did true. the trail cat. They stuck, a, they stuck a Hellcat power plant into a Wrangler. No, I, I think that there would be mass disruption in... In, in, in the uh, time warp, continuum yeah, time, in, anything that... that in we, local <laughs> communities if they did a Hellcat Wrangler. <laughs> yep. I, I mean, I, I, Jeep, build it. <laughs> they will buy it. Well, let us know what you guys think of the 392 Wrangler. Uh, yeah, and uh, we've got a couple of videos coming, so uh, we've only got it for one more day, so right after this podcast, we're actually taking it, and once again, i got the keys in my hot little hands here, and we're going to go compare it to the Defender, which we haven't done yet. Yep. Uh, and then uh, you did a really great off-road review of it, where you took it, where did you take it? Um, I took it and did some rock crawling, I did some um, higher speed stuff on dirt road, I, I did a launch, which was pretty cool, you could see all four wheels spin at the same time, just shoot rocks at the back, so that's coming up soon. Yeah, and then a TFL car today, we published a first drive video with me and Nathan where we kind of kind of got to off-road it uh, behind the rocks right but that was just a you know a, a group ride so it's really hard to produce a professional video but you stayed a day later in Moab and actually took your time and got the drone footage and actually got a more in-depth uh, review of this uh, and then we're gonna compare it to the uh, Defender and then we've got the MPG loop so there's a lot more 392 content coming uh, I'm super psyched that we have it for the weekend if all goes well we'll take it to cars and coffee uh, and, and Tommy, I'm going to put you on the spot here. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot. If it were your money, all right, out of now the what? I said four or five different variations of the Wrangler. Which one would you get? Probably still the, <laughs> probably still the 3.6 liter Pentastar. Really? Yeah, I haven't driven the 4 by E, um, but that's also pretty expensive. I mean, that starts at forty-eight thousand dollars. The 36 has been around since 2012 on the Wrangler. It's very proven. Um, and it's just, it's it's the, the base engine, but it's got plenty of power, plenty of torque, kind of a, a BG, but it's the one I'd get. Fair enough. All right, guys, thanks for uh, listening. And remember, check out TFL.
off-road uh, and TFL Car for more videos on the 392. Uh, and thank you to Jeep for uh, all the hard work they put in and letting us go drive and play in the, in the dirt with their uh, very expensive prototypes. Uh, it's something that uh, most car companies don't do, maybe they should, but we're very grateful that they do it. Yep. See you guys next time. Ciao. Bye.